Hi there, everybody. Welcome to week seven of ABCD Repronym. This is the restarting of our Q&A session that we will have each week on Fridays. Um, we are really excited to be back. We know it was a bit of a long break and we are really hoping to get everybody excited about relaunching this course um, here for our session number two. Uh, we hope that you did have a safe and happy and relaxful break and that you are ready to dig back into this exciting course material. Um, one thing we want to highlight before we get begin is that now is the time for us to really make some progress on those project week proposals. We've had a number of them get submitted to um, GitHub. We would like to encourage more of you to go ahead and start working on those project proposals. We invite you to use the lectures of last session and this session to think really hard about what kind of project you'd like to work on for that week. And the deadline to submit the project proposal will be February 12th. Um, this, is, this is before the uh, session two ends, which gives us time to really uh, prepare then for project week, which starts March 8th. Um, this week for our Q&A, we are very excited to have Deanna Barch and our own JB Poline, who is a little late right now. He's, he'll be joining us very soon. Um, but please do welcome Deanna Barch. We haven't had her yet on our Q&As and we're really excited to have her here. Deanna, would you like to say hi? Hello, everybody. Happy to be here and look forward to discussing this with you. Excellent. Uh, so this week, the lectures uh, from Dr. Barch were on ABCD demographic, physical and mental health assessments, and from Dr. Pauline on Reapernim scientific questions and statistical issues. So today's Q&A will be covering both of those topics. We'll try to do a nice balance of the two. Um, as a reminder, enrolled students, please go ahead. If you have not had a chance yet, we need you to complete that ABCD data access ducks data survey that's in your Canvas portal. Um, as of today, only 23 students have filled that out. We realize that um, you know, getting your duck approved is a fairly long process, but we hope that many of you were able to make pro progress with that over the break. So if you have, please go ahead and fill that survey out. As a reminder, you know, we need duck approval for you to participate in project week. Um, so this is a really key aspect of um, us knowing whether or not uh, project week will be uh, a go for many of you. So um, please have a look at that. Uh, with that, I will pass it over to Dave Kennedy uh, for some instructions on his end. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, join the, the team in encouraging and welcoming you all back and re-excited for this last set of uh, weeks of lectures and then really ramping into the, the uh, project week again. Uh, I think most of the high level announcements have done been done already by Angie, so I just get to cheer and um, uh, really encourage us all to, you know, have fun and learn and really get to some exciting projects. Uh, my other job is to introduce uh, Christina as our lead TA today, uh, and I'll let her say a little bit about uh, herself just as an introduction. Sure, yeah, so I'm very excited to be kind of leading the session today. Um, I. I uh, was on here last term for one of these. So if you uh, missed me then or missed that week, um, my name is Christina Rapuano. I am a postdoc with BJ Casey at Yale. Um, I work with the ABCD data. Um, my interests are specifically um, focusing on the role of development uh, or brain development in um, health risk behaviors. So things like substance use, um, yeah. Great, and I guess the rest of our announcements come from uh, Jessica. Welcome back. Hi. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, paralleling what everybody has said, I hope you've all had a really happy holiday and a happy new year. Um, thanks, Christina, for hosting um, today's q and um, I just wanted to make a, a few quick announcements um, about uh, session two moving forward. Um, the TA help hours for enroll students are going to be starting up again next week. Um, they're going to be at the same time as they were for um, this past session one. Um, if that time no longer works for you as an enrolled student, feel free to go in uh, and uh, sign up for a new time with a new TA. Um, that is totally fine. 
Um, these sessions are meant to, they're, they're not required attendance, but they are meant to be helpful spaces where you can work with someone on the data exercises. Um, and we expect the data exercises might get um, uh, a little bit more computationally intensive for this second term. So um, make sure that you use that resource if you feel like you need it. Um, the TAs are awesome and there to help. Um, if you are an, a, a not an enrolled student, an observer student, um, you have the Neurostars available for you and the TAs are also still looking at that Neurostars to see if any questions that you have are coming up there and they'll be there to answer those as well. Um, one other uh, set of announcements before we get going into today's Q&A. Um, over the break, um, we sent out an email with um, a link to the session one survey that we put out. Um, we haven't had a lot of people fill that out yet, but if you could, we would really, really love for you to fill that out. Um, it's basically a survey that tells us how session one went for you um, and the information you provide on that will help us create a better session two. Um, so there's a link to that on the materials page. You can also check your email. We sent out an email on Monday um, and it's also in there. So please go fill out that session one survey when you have a chance. Um, uh, and then also we sent out an over the break data exercise. We're kind of recontextualizing that as a, as a project week prep data exercise, um, which is more of like a tutorial on how to do some of the um, computationally um, involved things about downloading the uh, newest ABCD data release, working with it, visualizing it. And so um, please do give that um, a try um, in uh, this upcoming week um, because uh, we're gonna be releasing part three of that uh, project week prep data exercise next week and parts one and two that we released over the break are going to be important for the stuff that we uh, push out in part three of it. Um, uh, last announcements for me, we're going to be pulling out some more details about project week um, soon. Um, we've received some questions about when uh, the project week proposals are due, which is, uh, as Angie mentioned, February 12th, which is two weeks before the last session of the course. Um, so if you have an idea for what kind of thing you would like to work on for project week, please do submit a proposal for that. Uh, the submission for a project proposal idea is through GitHub. You just open an issue, type in, uh, there's an example in there, uh, type in what you think you want to work on. Um, and that'll be kind of an idea generation space where people can either join your project or comment on it. Um, so please, if you do have an idea or if you don't yet have an idea, think about what kind of uh, things you might want to work on for a project week um, and submit a proposal. Uh, and then also uh, we did announce uh, that we are opening up project week for observer participants who are actively participating in the class and have completed all session one assignments. We are going to be sending out kind of a sign up invitation thing for um, observer students in that boat who are interested in participating in project week. We're gonna be, we're gonna be sending that out um, uh, this next week. So you have uh, until Monday to finish all your session one assignments. Um, uh, if you have finished all your session one assignments, you will be getting an invitation uh, to uh, join us for project week. Uh, so finish those up and uh, and we're excited to, to see how project week is going to unfold. With that, I'll turn it back over to Christina for some of the questions um, that students have put in for today's set of lectures. Awesome. Um, all right. Thanks for all of the introductions and announcements. Um, I think we have a good set of uh, questions here. So I think we'll just go ahead and get started with a ABCD question uh, for uh, Dr. Barch. Uh, so um, thank you for the wonderful lectures. I'm wondering how we can better interpret the self-reported data about children's mental health. I wonder if we can trust the self-reported response about their own mental health, especially when the participants are children. That's a great question. And it's actually one of the reasons that we included both parent and child report. Um, and you know, it's a bit of an empirical question. Um, we have a paper that we're working on right now with the, the diagnostic information 
um, supported, uh, you know, reported by children versus adults. And we're looking at that in relationship, for example, to teacher reported mental health as a way of having sort of like an external validation of how the kids are going in school. So far, we do see that the teacher reports tend to correlate a bit more strongly with the parent diagnostic information than the kid diagnostic information, at least for some of the things. Um, so that would hint at maybe kids self-report at least on the kind of categorical case ads are maybe a little bit questionable. But I will also say that a number of people are finding that in some cases, kids self-report of mental health correlate with brain variables in ways that the parent reports do not, right? So I'll just give you an example from my own lab where we're working on a project looking at depression and resting state functional connectivity. And we definitely see stronger relationships of resting state functional connectivity to kid reported depression than we do to parent reported depression. So, you know, I think this is an empirical question. There is a literature out there pointing to when kid report may or may not be valid. Um, and we, and I suspect that as time goes on and the kids get older, their self-reports will become increasingly more valid and sort of, especially about more kind of sustained things. Okay. Um, and then kind of extending off of there, uh, along the same lines of children um, kind of reporting their own um, behaviors or or whatnot. Um, so this is a more general question, not particularly related to this week's lecture, uh, but this person is wondering if the experience of being periodically monitored fairly often and having periodical gatherings with their cohort, um, uh, would that affect children's development? Um, and so I kind of just may maybe as an example, I can add on to here. Um, I could imagine if a child is, you know, regularly being asked about their uh, substance use that might then influence um, their actual use, um, you know, if they know that they're going to be getting hair samples and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a great, another great question. And it's something we talk about all the time. Um, I think it'll have an impact, right? I mean, how could it not have some sort of impact? Um, you know, one of the things that we've talked about at various times is whether at some point in time, there's a name for this and I can't remember the name for it, but you basically go in at a later point in time and like recruit a cross-sectional sample of kids with similar demographics that um, weren't followed over time. And you compare like rates of various things across the two cohorts to see what impact your, um, you know, sort of long-term study has had on them. Um, and that is something that may be worth thinking about doing when the kids are like 18 or 20 to see like how do the rates that we see in our kids really compare to a demographically similar sample that has not been part of this, you know, groundbreaking study for, you know, 15 years. Um, I will tell you that I have been involved in other, I've been involved in a different longitudinal study where we started working with kids when they were between the ages of three and five, and we followed them for 17 years. Um, and there was still um, a remarkable level of substance use, risk-taking behavior, all kinds of things. Now, I don't know how that compared to kids who who weren't studied, but it certainly didn't eliminate children engaging in behaviors that you know they might not otherwise want to tell their parents about. But they also knew all along that we couldn't tell their parents unless there was something that put themselves or others at danger. So, and, and I, and we stuck with that. So I do think over time they came to trust that, you know, we weren't going to rat on them, but nonetheless, it might still change their awareness of things and, you know, their kind of interactions with their parents or peers in ways that we don't really know exactly how that's going to have an impact. Right. Okay. Okay, great. So, um, I think we'll maybe move to a question actually for both of you. Um, uh, so for both uh, Deanna and JB, uh, Dr. Barch mentioned uh, or brought up the issue of needing to apply the same measures to conduct longitudinal analyses, but also not being able to apply the same assessments across the study due to developmental age, making them inappropriate. Can one of you speak to how we can conduct longitudinal analyses on data that use different measures over time? <laughs> I don't know that you want to try to. Tackle. I can I can tackle that first, and I, but I'm going to attack. So I think that, um, you know, I think it depends on the measure. Um, 
if, you know, there have been some measures that have already been kind of normed. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, there's like the children's depression inventory and the adult Beck depression inventory. Um, so you, you, you know, there is a, you need to change developmentally what you use because sort of the way you would ask questions of kids or, or the way things might express themselves differ across the course of development. But each of those have been normed for their respective age ranges. So you can still ask questions about, you know, how depression levels are changing across time in terms of like individual differences, you know, is this child showing a different trajectory than that child, right? Because even though the measure changed, it changes in the same way for everybody at roughly the same age. And so I think you could still ask these questions about trajectories and individual differences. I think one is very limited in making absolute statements about developmental change on average when measures have to change, right? So I would never be comfortable saying something like, you know, okay, we had to change, um, you know, the measure we, I'll just keep with depression as an example. You know, we, we had to change from the, you know, brief problem monitor, well, that's not a good example either, but say you had to change your depression measure from nine to 10 to 15 to 16. I would never wanna make a claim that on average 15 to 16 year olds have less depression than nine to 10 year olds if you happen to find that the mean value is different. Um, but what I would be comfortable with is if I found that children who experienced early poverty early in life tended to show you know, more of an increase in depression from ages nine and 10 to 15, 16 than kids who didn't have uh, living in poverty, you know, as a factor, if everything was sort of assessed at the same age, because, you know, then you're asking about differences in trajectories um, across the same measures, even though they've changed, if that makes sense. Um, I was, uh, yeah, I was thinking a bit along the lines as well of a, a self-normalization aspect, like uh, let's say you have a group. So I understood the question that the assessment is actually different, right, from the you know, uh, long time. Mm -hmm. So one, one possibility as well, uh, I mean, you know, kind of I said, like the normalization aspect, uh, you know, if you can, uh, uh, is, is clearly one, one aspect. But if you have a third measure uh, to which those things can be compared, uh, this is also a, a, a way to normalize, but there's also self-group normalization. Let's say you rank people in the way uh, they relate to some uh, uh, other measures or brain imaging or other things. And then, and then that ranking may change. And that's, that's uh, sort of like, a, uh, again, not absolute, but relative aspect. Uh, possibly could be interpreted. Uh, so yes, I, I think uh, uh, along those lines as not absolute, uh, but uh, relative to um, uh, other measures or, or, or within the group measure. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, those are great points. I really like the, the idea of ranking. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, JB, we'll stick with you for one more. Um, okay, so suppose we want to run a power analysis for a study we plan to do with the ABCD data. My understanding is that uh, power analyses should only be done with pilot data, but if I'm not mistaken, we don't have that for the ABCD study. So does that mean we should not run power analyses for studies we want to do with ABCD data? Um, so, so there's always the possibility of like a left out data. Like uh, you, you, you can you can always say, hey, I'm going to take those uh, five ten percent uh, data and estimate uh, the effect size and estimate uh, some of the variances and uh, you know the, those things. So, so that's uh, you know uh, how much data you should take is uh, I think is is still hard because uh, we. Um, I mean, uh, unless you know the results, you can't actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, have those numbers. Uh, so I think I would rely on, you know, uh, literature, uh, you know, examples and see if you can find a study that does this sort of thing and, and uh, um, otherwise uh, take something that, you know, you think, okay, uh, with, uh, let's say, you know, 50 subjects or let's say 100 subjects, I, I, I do believe I would have a reasonable estimate uh, for that uh, for that measure. Um, so uh, uh, so that's one one point. The other point is um, uh, yes, all those power analyses. Uh, uh, they, they, I mean, the estimation of the effect size and the confidence interval uh, after a measurement is is still is still a very uh, relevant uh, f uh, measure to report. Uh, so even if you don't have power analysis in terms of de determination of the number of uh, subjects that you need for a specific effect size, uh, you can still you know, uh, say, 
uh, you know, uh, with that effect size post post hoc, uh, th this is the kind of power that I would have. And yes, it's not the actual power of the analysis because it's uh, observed on the on the data that you've been using for estimating that effect size. But it does give you some indication as well. Uh, it's not no indication. So, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, those two things. <laughs> That's really helpful. Um, okay, we'll flip back. I think to an ABCD question. So. Um, for Deanna, are the socioeconomic status questions administered the same uh, across each year? So um, the student expects the pandemic might be highly impactful for this. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and sadly, 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 this might be an experiment of nature that we don't often see because in the US these days, there's not a lot of economic mobility, quite frankly. And so in most samples, we don't see that there's a very big change up or down in terms of people's SES status over time. And that may occur because of the pandemic. So we do ask the questions in the exact same way. We have both um, the you know, caretaker reported like com total combined family income. We also have family structure. So we have a sense of how many people need to be supported by that income if someone wanted to compute income to needs. Because that, you know, one that's one thing that could really change in the pandemic too. Maybe other, you know, extended family members get, you know, evicted, and your household has to become larger, and that money has to stretch farther. Um, and then we also have the um, we call them subjective. I don't know that that's really the right word, but we have seven questions about like things like, you know, is your electricity getting cut off? Can you not go to the doctor? You can't afford dental care. And then the uh, the Environment work group is also working on what we call the ADI measures, which is the air deprivation index. And then we have a new measure called the SVI, which is the social, social victimization is not the right word, but it's another measure of like the area in which a child is embedded and what the sort of economic and other adversity indicators are for that area. Right now, we just have the ADI for their baseline address, but we are gonna be trying to more systematically track from birth across the course of the study, those measures so that we can look at if people are moving or changing their area and that's an indicator of socioeconomic status as well. So great question. Awesome, um, sort of semi-related to that. So within the same section of um, discussing the demographics that are um, collected for part of, for ABCD, um, you had talked about the distinction between uh, sex and gender. So we had a question about um, whether parents and kids understand the differenti differentiation between sex and gender, um, given that these terms are often conflated. And um, how are the sex at birth and gender identity measures explored? Um, also great questions. So um, the, the, this has evolved a little bit over the course of ABCD. Um, I think we did a little, we did an, an okay job of this at baseline using um, like, for example, many more options for parents to report on about their children and distinguishing sex at birth versus, you know, current gender identity or expression. And um, we didn't have a lot of evidence that parents didn't understand that distinction. Definitely in the case at baseline, I don't, we think that some kids didn't understand that distinction as much. And I, I think that has clearly improved over time. Uh, Lexi Potter now uh, heads the GISH work group, which is gender identity and sexual health, which has done a whole lot of work to enhance the assessments in the ABCD to, to get, for example, dimensional assessments of gender identity. So as opposed to just saying like categorically, you either identify as a male or female, like how much do you feel like a girl? How much do you feel like a boy? Which we think is gonna be really interesting. And the same thing for sexual identity and sexual health. So I haven't personally explored that, um, but the 3.0 release has some pretty rich data on that. And I think it will be really interesting to look at over time. At baseline, we, we had a very small number of kids who fully identified as um, transgender. I think that is increasing, at least it's increasing in the sense that there is much more variability in gender identity and sexual identity as the kids get older, which makes sense, I think. Right, yeah, that'll be really interesting to look at. Um, I just realized um, we had a follow-up question for JB about the um, uh, power analyses. So um, it's just a follow-up. Isn't post hoc power analysis just another way of doing null hypothesis testing? I thought post hoc power analysis was useless. 
uh, it, it, yes, I think uh, that's right, but it's not entirely useless again because you, in the process of computing power, you get to uh, this estimation of effect sizes that really are critical to me. Um, and, and yes, if, uh, if your specific analysis may find a high FX size and, uh, and therefore like a, uh, a good power for that specific FX size, and if those, uh, if the numbers of participants is small, then yes, you probably are overestimating that FX size and uh, in, the, in, that, in that sense, it is useless. However, if you do find that, you know, that FX size is uh, still relatively small and then uh, even like post hoc power is not, uh, you know, is, uh, is, is, you know, is, is not great and we'll, that gives you some indication. Uh, and I think that's those indications are, are worth uh, uh, having. And also uh, just again, looking at those effect sizes, but also making sure that you compute uh, confidence intervals uh, uh, is, is would, would give you. So the process of computing those numbers is actually you know, giving you more understanding of, your, of the data. Uh, so I think that's in that in that sense it's actually not useless. Uh, as well as the comparison between even even post hoc, uh, you know, you could have uh, more or less uh, high power. So uh, I think that's uh, those two things uh, are useful. Okay, that was helpful. So um, we'll stick with uh, you for one more, JB. So how do we know if we are overfitting our models? I, I imagine this is easy to do with the ABCD data because there are so many different measures we can include in, in our models. Yes, uh, and that's a huge danger. Uh, uh, the, basically, the, the, the usual problem is uh, if you have many variables, you, you will have to have a huge number of, of participants. I mean, and there's no, as kind of like, you know, would have fun because, uh, but uh, I think in the task paper, it was, you know, using the example of a, uh, 20 variables and 50 patients, uh, 50 subjects. And, that, and that's, that's clearly a case where you will overfit. Uh, so, uh, so the answer is, so, I mean, first of all, uh, you know, people would say usually uh, something like, a, okay, 30 subjects, more like a, a rule of thumb, uh, maybe a few variables, two, three maximum, that's, you know, that's a, but 30 subjects is an extremely small number for whatever you're doing. And, uh, and even like if you don't use that many variables and if you do have like a, a, a less uh, overfitting sort of a, a risk, uh, you, you, you do have to realize that with 30 subjects, you may be very well have sampled those 30 subjects within a specific case. And like, a, uh, or if you have to extract those 30 subjects from different characteristic in a, in a large cohort, uh, like ABCD, uh, you, you still are sampling a, a small number of subjects. Uh, and that is really the key problem. That's you know, how much of those results are going to uh, be retained uh, when you re, uh, relaunch another study with another uh, 30 or 50 subjects. And that's, uh, uh, so, so yeah. So, uh, so basically complex model only if you have a huge number of participants, uh, and a uh, and, uh, small number of participants, even if you don't have that many variables to test or to investigate, uh, you still have to be uh, extra careful or skeptic or, you know, like uh, in the conclusions, uh, you know, how much of that is going to be uh, refound uh, on another uh, group. So I, I think, yeah, I was just going to say, I think this is a really important question and we should probably get multiple perspectives on. And I noticed Deanna was nodding. So would you like to also respond and maybe with some experiences from your own lab? Yeah, so I, I would agree with everything JB said. I will say though that I have been really pushing the folks in my lab when they want to do more exploratory analyses or large numbers of variables to really think about setting up a sort of train and test model where you know we take either like at one like say you have baseline data right identify you know a, a train data set or an exploratory data set and then a data set of which we can ask whether we replicate the findings. And I can tell you from experience that even if you use the most robust and conservative false positive correction in a very exploratory analysis, a big chunk of that won't replicate. And I think there is a false level of comfort in str stringent FDR correction in exploratory analyses. People think, oh, I did really stringent. It's going to all, and it doesn't. Um, so I really would encourage people to think about that, either like splitting up one wave or thinking about replication across multiple waves, because I, I think it's really easy to forget how much false positives you can get even with, because the data is powerful. And especially with, if you're using like 
especially if you get into like machine learning or deep learning methods that will just find every little nuance of sample specific variants, you know, you can get what looks like really wonderful results that just don't replicate at all. And uh, just to add on this, uh, absolutely, uh, and I like the, the, the aspect of uh, testing your model on some other data is the thing that really uh, gives you some confidence. I mean, uh, and, uh, and, and it's, it's, I mean, having that framework of cross-validation, uh, even in a classical setting of uh, hypothesis testing is super important because you, you don't have the actual expected error, <laughs> predicted error, but you have an, an estimation of the expected predicted error. And, uh, and just that estimation, you know, is, is super important to have a, an idea of, uh, it's, um, it's, it's uh, yet another problem that if you had another ABCD data that were acquired a bit differently and uh, how much of that will replicate to another study is yet another problem. But even within your sample, uh, having an estimate of that prediction error is such an important sort of, uh, you know, like a, uh, information for, to, uh, to convey what's, what's the solidity of the, uh, of the result. Uh, those are all really great points. And actually, we had a related question that was posted before we started talking about um, splitting data. So I'm going to go ahead and ask it. And if there's anything additional you want to add, um, we can talk about it more. Um, so I'm interested in um, an ex uh, explanatory model using linear regression. Would it still be useful to split the data to see what generalizes? What more could I say about the results if they generalize versus if I just ran a regression on the entire data set with no splitting? Again, the, the thing that you could be able to say more is uh, uh, how do I expect my model to uh, behave on, on if I had sampled other data? Uh, and that's, that's really uh, the, uh, the, the gist of it. Uh, uh, and, you know, and it's sample other data uh, at the moment you know, within the same cohort or within the same sort of like a population. If you believe that your population and your sample were randomly done on those things, I mean, that this is good. Sometimes you those this population would be specific to let's say uh, a society or region uh, a scanner like you know there's a there's a number of uh, factors that may uh, restrict your capacity to generalize your result to other uh, uh, things. So uh, be also careful that um, when you're doing uh, split data, uh, you're randomly splitting the data, and sometimes if you have like a, a small test and like a not to, again depending on the amount of data, like a small test and small train or like a, you know this, uh, uh, those those could randomly be fairly uh, you know different. So so what people usually do is they they split the data from you know a number of ways, like you know, and, and then uh, sort of look at the average results or like what, how the results behave uh, across split, not only within one split. Uh, Great. Um, so we'll flip back to an ABCD question. So um, apologies if this was mentioned in earlier lectures, but where can we find the actual mental health assessments? So for example, the questionnaires they might have answered um, that were administered to participants, is that available for viewing? So um, it is, as far as I know, there's no place that you can go right now and see all the individual measures. Um, we had talked to the NDA about doing that, um, suggesting that we have a, the ability to like take all the REDCap data dictionaries and put them in there. Um, but the questions, the, the actual questions are, is my understanding, all in the data dictionary in the NDA. You can't just like download the form like we administered it, but if you look in the data dictionary for almost everything except for the case ads, I believe it says sort of the exact question that was asked. The case ads is proprietary. So we are not allowed to give it out, but if you write Ken Kobach, who's, who's the person in charge of it, um, uh, he has been giving it out or at least chunks of it if people have sort of reasons why they wanna look at the actual questions. Yeah. And personally, I've found the, the data dictionary to be incredibly useful. I, you know, go to that, I feel like, yeah. very, very frequently. Um, yeah, well, this is hopefully something that RepoNim is doing in terms of the red cap things, because um, it would be hugely helpful for people just to be able to go and use them for their same old study, same, use them for their studies using literally the exact same questionnaires that the ABC did. And we tried as much as possible not to use things that were, you know, paid, those kinds of things. So there's only a few that are not 
generally publicly available. Great. Um, all right, so JB, um, we have a couple of questions that are, I think, somewhat related. Um, can you say more about how we would practically go about estimating the odds ratio to calculate the PPV and um, kind of um, maybe relatedly, does positive predictive value have different names in other fields? Um, so how do you calculate the PPV, the, uh, the odd ratio, if you want to have like a, some idea of uh, how uh, reproducible your result will be, um, given that you have a positive test? Um, uh, so that's a tough question, <laughs> uh, because there's no, uh, I don't think there is a way. Um, I think it's it's um, it's it's interesting the process that you are when you're asking that question you're really asking yourself when I'm going to test that hypothesis how uh, likely is the result to be uh, positive or not and and just asking yourself that question is really interesting because uh, if you're pretty sure that you uh, you're actually you know going to get the result. Uh, you know, that's uh, you, 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 you are in a more like a, a confirmatory and I would say uh, sort of like, you know, uh, uh, I would say, yeah, confirmatory aspect of, of, of a study. If you're um, fairly unsure, I'd say, let's say, I really have no idea. I can't, I can't, you know, I, and this is a question that is motivated, but, you know, it's motivated by, uh, you know, maybe sparse results, uh, previous results, and it's motivated by uh, an idea that, you know, could be absolutely wrong and I have no idea. Then the thing I would do is say, hey, have an, have an estimate, say, uh, okay, that idea is probably one chance over two or maybe uh, one chance over, over four, uh, you know, and, 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 and just compute that PPV with those values and see, uh, you know, have a range of, you know, this, this is, you know, the range that I'm estimating and this is uh, uh, what I, I, I suppose it's going to be. And one way of also looking at that is knowing your literature and and uh, and thinking post talk of um, uh, some hypotheses that you know feel uh, oh that result is was surprising to me or not uh, you know is is one way of thinking of this this probability aspect of the of uh, of whether they are uh, the, the hypothesis but again it's 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 really in the framework of hypothesis testing and uh, and it's it's a tough framework in a, in a sense uh, you if you want to do it properly uh, you know you know that already but you have to do pre registration think of your hypothesis after the, I mean, do the review of the literature, think of your hypothesis and then start to, um, you know, write that down before you do any uh, looking at data and uh, those things. So which it's, it's a tough, it's a tough framework. I don't think many people actually uh, follow it <laughs> properly. And, and hence the problem of uh, false positive that we get in the literature. Um, yeah. Okay. And then the other question is, um, does positive predictive value have different names in other fields? I don't know actually. Uh, um, uh, it's it's the same name in the um, uh, in the epidemiology uh, literature. So uh, it it uh, it has a very different uh, uh, flavor to it in a sense because it's uh, it's more like a, a characteristic of a test. Uh, you know, in a, uh, but it's um, and a population because you need to have the prevalence of the disease uh, in uh, to compute it. But um, but I don't I actually don't know the answer to that question whether there are um, I'm I'm I suppose there will be somewhere a field where he has a different name but I, I don't I don't know. Okay, so um, for um, Deanna, so Dr. Barsh mentioned in her lecture that parents and kids don't always agree on the mental health assessments. Can you maybe speak to how we should think about this in our analyses? Yeah, that's a you know, kind of riffing off the previous, I mean, um, I mean, one, we're looking explicitly at the agreement. I can tell you it's not great. <laughs> uh, we have a paper that one of my colleagues is working on that'll be a consortium paper that sort of looks at the diagnostic data and looks at parent-child convergence. Um, so the approach we've been taking in our own lab is when we have parallel measures from parents and children, we have been trying to do parallel analyses to look at how similar the results are with or without the parent versus child. Um, and so, you know, like I, I mentioned before, we've been doing some things with resting state functional connectivity and depression. And there are some things where we see some nice convergence where both the parent and the child report of depression are associated with the same functional connectivity metrics. In some cases where there's a stronger relationship to the kid versus the parent. So I think, asking explicitly about whether there's convergence and then, you know, 
doing parallel analyses if you don't have an, a strong a priori theoretical reason to want to go with parent versus child report. I, I do think they may be giving us different information, especially with like internalizing measures where the kids may have access to sort of internal experiences that parents don't have access to. Um, I will say for the most part, we are not asking kids to self-report on sort of more externalizing behaviors because of the evidence that um, self-reports of those kinds of things are probably not as valid as other reports. So there, we do have much more from the parent or the teacher perspective than we do uh, from the kid perspective. I think I wanna piggyback on that question for just a moment because I, I know in your talk, uh, uh, Dr. Birch, that you also mentioned that um, you looked at the mental health assessments of parents and how that might impact how they report on their children. And I thought that was mm -hmm. super interesting, um, but also not sure how one would build that into their analyses of those data. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, uh, we have looked at this because reviewers have sometimes asked us about this. So for example, um, one of my, uh, junior colleagues, we did a paper looking at the relationship between functional connectivity and like uh, we, had, we had done a separate paper looking at like hierarchical measures of psychopathology where you can sort of break it down into like internalizing versus externalizing and then either further subdimensions. And we had done it both in parent reports about the children on the CBCL and parent reports about themselves on the adult self-report questionnaire, which are sort of the parallel versions. So what she did was do analyses using the CBCL to predict functional connectivity in the kids, and then asked, for example, whether the relationship of the parent report about the child to functional connectivity remained if you controlled for the parent's own psychopathology in that same dimension which is one way of looking at it. And two, then asking whether the parent psychopathology directly predicted the functional connectivity. So you can sort of tackle it in a couple of ways. Because if it's just that the parent is depressed and they see depression and everything, which can happen, right? Then you would expect that the parent's self-report of their own depression would relate in the exact same ways as the parent report of the child depression if they're sort of just proxy of one for the other. But if you see that the parent report of child depression relates in ways that can't, that are that remain when you control for the parent's own level and don't relate to the parent's own level in the same way, then I think you can start to disentangle that. That was complex, sorry, <laughs> it was kind of uh, unclear. Well, I mean, it, it does seem like a very complex issue because there's the, the issue of, yeah, how a parent's mental health might color their report of a child's um, health or behavior. But then there's also the added component of, um, as you also mentioned in your lecture, um, a parent's mental health will likely have, you know, there, there might be shared genetics um, underlying child mental health or also the context in which the child is, is being raised in. So there's like all these kinds of things that are kind of mm -hmm. um, overlapping. Yeah. Very complicated. Yeah, but a lot to think about. Um, okay. So a couple more questions. So um, uh, do we have data on what medications the kids are taking and how consistently they take those medications for mental health uh, disorders over time? Thinking about medication switching, dosages, et cetera. Yes and no. <laughs> yes, in the sense that we do routinely ask about medications and the the DAIC, which is the Data Analysis and Informatics Center, has just done a yeoman's job of trying to come up with like a very structured way of assessing that that uses like standardized medication names because it's a nightmare. Like if you just ask parents to report or people to report on their medication use, they say all kinds of things and you, it's hard to match them up. So they've really done a lot of work on that. But all we have is what's prescribed we don't have adherence. So we don't have a good way of doing that. And the frequency we have, you know, at each contact with the kid, we ask about the medications, but we, um, I don't think go back. I think it's, I can't remember the exact wording. I know it's current. We definitely have current and I can't remember how far back we go, but like if the kid was prescribed a drug for two months, you know, nine months ago, it, it might not be captured at either assessment. So I would say that the 
the best, the strongest data we will have is what the kid is on at the time of the assessment and that we track that prospectively. So you would be able to do a reasonable job of looking at this sort of knowing, for example, which kids were on ADHD meds, which kids had anti-anxiety meds, those sorts of things. And we don't just do mental health meds, we do for everything. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, okay, so I think that might be all of the live questions we have um, active, but I, I noticed, uh, Deanna, that you might have um, typed in responses to a couple. So if you don't mind, just since we have a few minutes, can we uh, just talk about those for, I think people that are live streaming don't have access to the um, typed Q&A. So um, yeah, so I'll just kind of, we can briefly go over those. Uh, you mentioned that the KSATS one module had an autism-like measure that is not accepted as a diagnostic tool for autism and is therefore being switched out uh, um, as you transition into the improved KSATS two. Can you talk more about which diagnostic measures are accepted, diagnostic tools, and which are not? Yeah, so that's, um, and the KSATS, we're comfortable, or they tell us they're comfortable with everything other than the autism spectrum and psychosis measures. So I, we would not treat either of those as acceptable diagnoses. The autism spectrum one in case as 1.0 just kind of asks about independent symptom dimensions and it really isn't, it isn't, it does not have utility as like a good strong measure of autism. And the parent reported um, psychosis in the case ads I think is reasonable if you just want to know is the parent think the kid have hallucinations or delusions, but that's not the same as having a diagnosis, right, of something. So those are supposed to be improved in case ads 2.0. They've been working on those. Those are more challenging, but everything else we're pretty comfortable with as a, you know, a diagnostic instrument. Um, uh, the figs, you know, it's it's the field standard, which is the family interview for genetic studies, which is what we use to do family history. I mean, it it's not the same as giving someone a structured diagnostic interview, but it's the best we're going to get in a large scale study like this. So we kind of use it as a proxy for the idea that the, you know, extended family members had something, but you know, I would in no way claim that it, it, it's going to give you the identical results as if you were able to go and do a structured clinical interview with every single relative in the family. Right, of course. That makes sense. All right. And then the other one is, uh, I'm curious if the kids are wearing their Fitbits consistently and more specifically, if they're wearing them at night, do we have Fitbit sleep and sleep quality data from them? Um, I believe there, I, I haven't been as involved in the Fitbit data um, because that is part of the physical health work group and I chair the mental health work group. Um, but I do know that there's a whole bunch of kind of QC measures available about the Fitbits. And if Angie or anybody else knows more about that, feel free to jump in. Um, I haven't explored it in detail, so I don't know how much information is there. There's a ton of information. I haven't looked at it personally, but just in downloading it, it's like, there's a lot there. So I, I saw all those variables. I was like, dang. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So um, we do have a special week coming up just to talk about some of the um, the novel technologies, the mobile wearable and social media. Kara Bagat will be giving that lecture. That's in week 10 on February 5th. Um, and so we'll we'll make sure that that there's a lot more information about the, the Fitbit data that I think is personally fascinating, although I haven't looked at yet. I will also say I've been kind of keeping an eye on papers that are coming out looking at the Fitbit data. Um, and there is a recent um, preprint that looks to be, I, I mean, I'm not sure what else has been done so far, but this is just the first thing that I've personally seen. I haven't had a chance to look into this yet, um, but it's there in the chat window. This is um, a paper that is look at, looking at um, internalizing symptoms and, and Fitbit data. So it might be of interest to some of our attendees. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so I believe that's all the questions we have, unless um, anyone wants to post any last minute questions. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that JB or Deanna want to touch on with regards to um, the questions that we've talked about or, or the lectures more generally, um, or if there's any other announcements or things we need to discuss. If not, I think we can end a few minutes early. Yeah, the only thing is um, acquire more data, try your model on other studies, uh, get some uh, you know data that are outside of your own sample, those things. I think that's a, 
that's what the, the field needs. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This was very, very helpful. Sure thing. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.